that's what I can work with. Hello, come on in. Come on in, hi, take a seat. What's that? Okay, yeah, this is AMAT 100 with Professor Love. Well, it looks like we've got a good group already and there's two people online already. Riley and Isabella, hello, good morning. I've got my mic, I've got my speakers up. So if you talk, you, I should be able to hear you two online, okay? All right. Um, today, we're just gonna go over a bunch of problems from sections one, eight, nine, and 10. Um, but before we do that, are there any questions about the course? None? No? I see you in that comfy chair every time. What's your name? Daniel. Yeah, you sit in that nice comfy chair on, on Zoom, right? Yeah. I recognize some of you that, you know, that share your video feed. Okay, no questions? No questions from people online? Let's see if they're in there. Well, thanks for coming this morning. It's great to have you. Um, I guess this is our first real meeting. I'm Professor Love, Tony Love. Um, we will continue to meet every Wednesday like this, okay? I've gotten a lot of responses about my survey uh, for, for doing this all online or doing this in person. Um, and it's pretty much a fair split between uh, who wants to, it in person and who wants it. Uh, online, um, but it's a little bit unfair because the people that want it online have to have it online. <laughs> so it's, I feel like that's a little bit of a biased result uh, to say that it's split. So we'll continue to do this unless, uh, unless the situation changes, okay? Um, for better or for worse, you know, we could have class every, every week two times, you know? <laughs> okay, so no questions about the class. Um, I'll just start with some problems then. I tend to choose way too many, so getting started early is not a problem. Okay, so the first one is from section 1.8, and this is number 11. And it just gives us a list of numbers. Hi, good morning, come on in. We've got this set S, which is negative five, negative one, Zero, two thirds, five, six, one, three, five, three, and five. Those are big list of numbers, and we're just asked which of these satisfy the inequality, one over x. is less than or equal to one half. This is one of the most basic problems of this type. Right? You're just getting a list and you're asked, hey, which of these satisfy this inequality? So which of these numbers, when you plug in for x, make this true? Well, right away, what can you tell me about these two numbers? Yeah, this is negative, right? And are negative smaller than positive? Yeah, right away. These two, check. Check. Those two make it work. How about zero? Yeah, we have no idea. We can't say yes or no, so we're going to cross that off, say no. And now we have a work path for us. Let's start from the other end of things because these are nicely ordered. 
one over five, one fifth less than a half. You take something, you break it into five parts. That's definitely then, if you take that same thing, break it into two parts. So this is all right. Oh. Number three, or the three here, same thing. One third is definitely less than one half. Root five, wait, this is where we get out of calculator. What is root five? Is it bigger than two? Yes, because five is more than four, and the root four is two. So the root five is definitely bigger than the root four. So this is bigger than two, which means that this is less than one over two. Because the denominator is bigger, right? Numerator is the same, denominator is bigger. So that works. And now we've got some easy ones. One over one. Yes. Uh, that's because rational five is bigger than rational four, which is two. So if you take the reciprocal, you know that the inequality switches. So the one over rational five is less than rational four. Okay, so these three in the middle are the more difficult cases, but they're still not that bad. One divided by one is one. One is bigger than one half, so that doesn't work. And now we get into fractional division. Let's do these ones. One more. How do we treat fractions like this? What do we learn about this? How do we treat these things? See this. Flip the denominator and multiply, right? Same as one times six over five, which is six fifths. Six fifths is definitely bigger than one half, so that doesn't work. And what's going to happen with two thirds is the exact same thing. We're going to get three halves, and three halves is bigger than one half. So that's it. So here they are. These five numbers work. Okay, next problem is section 18, number 24. We've got a, an inequality that we want to solve. It just says solve, uh, write the answer in interval notation and graph the set. So this is 24, uh, 2 fifths of x plus 1 less than 1 fifth. Okay, um, solving inequalities is no different than solving inequalities. You just you perform the same types of things. There's only one minor difference, uh, and that's where you divide by negatives. So things flip around, right? Um, we'll get to that if we have that problem. First, let's isolate all the x's on one side like we normally do. So, I don't care which way. You want to bring everything left or right? Left, okay. One person voted left. So, add two x to both sides, and that gives us two this plus two x's, which is 12 this. You know, there's one really great thing about these masks is none of us can see when we're struggling with adding things like this. <laughs> For a minute there, my face grimaced as I had to add two this and two, but you couldn't see that. The only thing you can see is the sweat. So here we go. Uh, 12 this x plus one, less than one. Let's bring the one over through subtraction. So we're going to subtract 5 fifths on the right side. We get 12 fifths x less than minus 1. It's negative 4 fifths. And now, good morning. We're 
We're just going to multiply by the reciprocal here. That's 5 plus. Okay, that'll make this 1. We distribute it over, cancel that out all together. And on the right side, we'll have our solution. So we've got x on the left is less than negative 4 fifths times 5 twelfths, which is negative 4 twelfths or negative 1 third. Fives cancel. And then negative 4 over 12 is negative 1 third. Questions on this one? Questions online? Can you all see this fine? On, on, online? Okay, I got a thumbs up. Great. Nothing too difficult so far. I'm going to skip way ahead to problem 58. So that problem, 24, is what we call a linear inequality because this is a line being less than another line. Right? We've got a slope and an intercept. A slope and an intercept. 58 is a nonlinear, which means we're working with something other than a line. Uh, and in 58, it's a cubic expression. 16x. less than or equal to x cubed. This is a line here on the left, but on the right, that's definitely not a line. Um, if we thought about this from a graphical perspective, 16 x looks like this. It's a really steep line, and x cubed looks like this. From that, can you tell me where you think the solutions will be? One of the solutions will be zero, and where are all of the other ones? Where is this line below this line? Over here. Right away, looking at the picture, I'm going to guess this is our answer. But we'll, we'll talk that away, and I'll show you how to solve it. That's our guess. All right, how do we do things like this? We bring everything to one side, okay? We isolate the x's if we can. So let's subtract the 16x over, which gives us mm -hmm. x cubed zero. Less than or equal to x cubed minus 16x. You know what? That graph will be perfect. We're going to see some mistakes here. This is wrong. Oh, this is wrong. Yikes. Graphs are good for intuition. Good for intuition. But they're not very solving the graph. So here we go. Uh, how do you think you should proceed here? I know at least one of you. Is Nick here? Yes. You know what to do. Your space map has put you on the spot. Yes, sir. We are going to factor. Yep. Say that one more time. Difference of two squares. Okay. You're on to the factoring. I feel like a Windows restart. Like. Take out an X first. And he says correctly, this is the difference of two squares. You factor that again. X minus four, X plus four. Definitely have something that we can potentially work with. Wow, you can't see that at all. That doesn't help. 
There's a technique that you can use for things like this. You see that this product is bigger than zero. Right? So the technique we can use actually deals with just looking at the signs of these things. If X is positive or negative, if this factor is positive or negative, if this factor is positive or negative. It's a really handy solution technique that I know Nick has done. And now the world in the philosophical tournament. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Okay, let's look at each of these factors first. Where is each factor zero? Where is this factor zero? Zero. <laughs> That's where this comes from. So when x equals zero, we have a zero factor. How about this? Positive four, and this one you said is minus four as well. So our graph did not show us these two things because my graph is not perfect by any means. But there are two other places here that we need to watch out for. Okay, so our original expression has a big domain, right? We think it's domain, the numbers you can plug in might be any real number. And we determine that three of them make this whole thing. Uh, zero equals zero, essentially, which is always true, right? These three numbers split up our domain very, very nicely. So I'm just going to put it on the number line here. We've got negative four, we've got zero, we've got positive four. We see that this division of our domain makes one, two, three, four nice little numbers. We've got this interval from negative four to negative infinity. We've got the interval in here. We've got the interval here and the interval here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these three factors and their signs on these different intervals. Okay. So I'm going to organize that in a nice way here in a chart. So Nice way to do this because it's three factors and four intervals. Okay. So on this interval, negative infinity to negative four. On this interval, negative four, zero. This one, zero to four. And this, is this getting way too low for you here? Are you good? Okay. And four to infinity. We've got four intervals. One, two, three, four. And we've got three factors, which I'm going to list up here. X, X minus four, X plus four. This is a nice table that can help us organize the signs of these three factors. So we're just going to ask ourselves the same question over and over and over again. What is the sign, positive or negative, of this factor at this interval. So this is all negative numbers and this is just x, the number, so this is negative. How about here? Still negative. Because every number between zero and negative four is negative. And we're just asking what the sign of that number is. So negative again. How about here? Positive for negative. Positive. And here? Same. Positive. We're just asking the sign of x if x is between four and infinity. Awesome. Okay, now it gets a little trickier, right? If we plug in a number that is smaller than negative four to this, is the result positive or negative? Let's pick one. That's negative five is in here, right? So negative five minus four. This is more negative, right? Yeah, this is just definitely negative. For any number we're plugging, we're taking a negative number, we're subtracting more, so it's more negative. Right. How about between negative four and zero? 
We're taking the negative number still, subtracting, and still get negative. Okay, now we're dealing with positive numbers. We're taking the positive number in between zero and four, and we're subtracting four from it. Are these numbers big enough to overcome the subtraction of four, or do we still have a negative number? Still negative, yeah. And the biggest number we can pick here is four, but we can't actually pick it. We have to pick something just less, okay? Subtract four. We've got a negative number. Only slightly negative, but negative. In this last interval, we're plugging in any number bigger than four. So when you subtract four from any number bigger than four, you get a positive result, right? This is positive. Last factor, I'll give you 30 seconds. Tell me what you think those signs are, and then I'll call out your names if I, if I know them. And that includes everyone online. <laughs> I think that was 30. We have at least one of them done, I hope. Okay, start over here on the right side. What's your name? Mohammed. All right, do you have one of them for me? One of them? All right, who wants to go second? <laughs> okay, well done. Well done. Okay, do we agree? You plug in? Okay. okay. Right. Very well done. Okay, so what was the purpose of all this? Let's go back to our problem, right? We wanted to know where 16x was less than or equal to x cubed. We rewrote this into an equivalence expression. That means it tells us the same information, and it's this. So the question is, where is the product of these positive? Well, what do you know about products of positive and negative numbers? Positive times a positive times a positive is positive. So guess what? Right here? That works. If we pick a number between 4 and infinity, it works. Because we get a positive result. So on our interval here, this is OK. Any number over there. What about four? What about the end point four? You get zero, right? Is zero greater than or equal to zero? Yeah. So four works. So I'm just going to start writing down the intervals here that work. Four, open square brackets, positive infinity, open brackets. Okay, next interval. What do we know about a positive times a negative times a positive? Positive or negative? Negative. We've got one negative in there, so this interval does not work. Okay, next interval up. Negative 4, 0. We've got a negative times a negative times a positive, which gives us positive. So this one works. Nice. Very good. Uh, negative 4. we got to check the endpoints. At zero, we've got zero, so that works. At negative four, we have zero, that works. So this is square brackets on both ends. And then here we've got three negatives multiplied together, which is a negative result. So it does not satisfy this expression. 
So this is it. This is the union or the, the collection of those two intervals. On a number line, it's like this. In interval notation, it's like that. In set builder notation, it's all x such that x is in, or in words, is in this. You could write it that way. You could also write it uh, with inequalities. Negative four less than or equal to x less than or equal to zero, comma uh, four less than or equal to x. I think that's everything the question is asking. It's a long problem. It takes quite a lot of work. Um, I will say this about this method. This is a lot to write down, okay? But you can do all of this in your head. Okay, once you find these, and you know, with a little bit of practice of this type of thing, you can just look at this number list and right away think, hey, these are my intervals. And in your head, you're just like, uh, positive, negative, negative. Okay, it, it works. You know what I mean? It doesn't take really any mental strain to just think about these products. The hardest part is analyzing where each thing is negative and positive. But with some practice, you can do this in your head, I think. Okay. Questions on this? Got a lot to erase here. Yes. I have a question. Yes, I got another one here in class, but you shoot first. I have a question. Um, why x is equal to zero? Why is x equal to zero? Up here? Yes. Okay, so these, these are the values for x. Which make our equivalent expression Zero equals zero. So we have this expression here. This is our equivalent expression. We took our original and we did some algebra and we get this. We look at this and we say which values of x make this equal? Zero, positive four, negative four. It's just like solving for the zeros of this polynomial. Okay, thank you. Daniel, do you have another question? Yeah, is that to graph the solutions that without adding the number line? This is the number line, yes. So, more clean, straight on, or less, unless you're going to deform it somehow. Uh, you just plot the thing, and then you put a closed circle to indicate the end. And then just eight in between. So we got four infinities. Four. The questions. No, it's um, this one. Mr. Love, I have a question. How were you able to use um, the negative four and zero? Um, how were you able to use the graph to let you know that it was going to fit into the equation and, and going to work? For, specifically for negative four and zero. Right. Um, how do we know zero and negative four would work? Well, when I look at this, part of me thinks, you know, I'm just comparing two numbers, and this is a way to compute each number. We compute the number, 
They multiply by 16 two different ways. So when I look at this, I think right away there's this super trivial answer, really easy answer, to make these two equal to each other. It's zero. Zero times 16, zero. Zero cubed, zero. Like right away, I think zero, when x is zero, this is definitely going to work. So I'm going to list it here. Now, if I go a little bit positive or a little bit negative, I'm kind of changing whether or not this might work. Right? A lot of these things boil down to this super sweet property of zeros. Um, zero is a very special number. We, you know, we, for things like this, we've got something called the zero product property. If in a giant product, one of those numbers is zero, the whole thing is zero. That doesn't work for any other number. It's really, it's really special. If I had one equals x, x minus four, x plus four, is one of these numbers one? No, no it's not. It does not have to be at all. If this is zero, does one of them have to be zero? Yes. Okay, so, so to answer your question, how do I know zero and negative four were definitely going to be these? My question is more, how did you use the, um, the graph you made with like list of all of the um, um, in, interval, intervals, yes, um, and um, there for negative four and zero, there is, um, the answer could have been negative, negative, or positive. Looking at this uh, graph, how were you able to know um, that it could have been fitted without, do, do you have to plug it in into the equation before you know to test it out or it's also visible there? Great question. Um, yeah, in this problem, you don't have to plug them in. Uh, I did just to sort of look at it, be more explicit with it, but you don't have to. And the, the reason is this, that's an inequality but it has an equal sign. So these numbers that give us zero here, those numbers will always be included. That's a general fact. So I did not have to go back and plug in these endpoints ever because they give us equality for zero and that's what we're looking for, equality for big. So I didn't have to plug them in, but I did just to try and show the process. Did you know that it was going to work because there's a positive for the x plus 4? No. I, I knew it was going to work because it, it causes this, this equation to be true, and this equation has an equal sign. Right? So when I plug in negative 4, this gives me 0, and that's what, that gives us equality here. And there's a connection between this sign and that sign. The connection is this one includes this. If I change this to this, suddenly I will not include them. Because I don't care if they make it equal. I only care if they're bigger. Is that, is that answering your question or not? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Right. Um, we're 30 minutes in. Let me ask, uh, are there problems from 1.8 that anyone is having difficulty with? Because if not, I'm going to move on because we spent a third of our time on one section and we've got two others to get to. Yeah. Yeah.
So you don't know how to solve those kinds of problems. Does anyone know how to solve those kinds of problems? So, so that, yeah, there's this, in general, in math, what you learn is how to solve certain kinds of problems. And that's that's a, a part of what you learn. How to solve Problems like A, B, C, you know, but there's only so many of these problems that you can learn how to solve. But there's a whole nother part of math where you learn how to rewrite problems. Why do we do that? Exactly. So you're asking a great question. We've got this problem. We don't know how to solve. It's off here in, in question mark land. You know? We don't know how to solve this problem. Let me give you an example here. X over X plus one, less than three. Greater than three is what the book says, but less than three is fine. You don't know how to solve this one because this is not zero. Okay. We can change it. We know how to change this into a problem we know how to solve. And the first step is to make one of these sides zero, and then do the whole same thing that we just did. Let's just subtract the three over. Let's find a common denominator. Combine fractions and we're golden, right? X minus 3x minus 3 over x plus 1 less than 0. Combine like terms and you just keep going. You know how to do that, right? You look at the factors at the top, which make it 0. You look at the bottom where you have a negative 1, and that won't work. And so you divide your interval, your real one line, into these three parts. Negative 1 is one of them. That's what makes this impossible. On top, we've got x minus 3x, so negative 2x minus 3. That is equal to 0 at x equals hard math. Negative 3 halves. So here's our intervals over here, and here, over there. Make the table, check the signs. You're looking for negative results this time. And that's it. So Nick, your great question, how do we solve problems we don't know how to solve? Well, the algebra, you know, manipulating expressions like what I just did into equivalent expressions, um, leaps of faith, Where you blindly go for it and you think, hey, will this work? And then you check your work later and you say, oh, yes, or oh, no, or sometimes. Uh, you've got other things like uh, intuitive leaps or intuitive jumps. Uh, these, when you're all math majors in your senior year, you'll have a lot more of these up to sleep because you'll learn how to change things like this into. Things will look way different, but you can solve them really, really nicely. Uh, things that were previously unsolvable, you'll change into completely different problems and then solve them. And it's, it's like magic. Math magic, they say. Okay. So I'm going to go to 1.9 then. Um, 1.9 was on, and I'll do this by poll was on more or less graphing, plotting points, plotting uh, sections of the plane, finding midpoints, finding um, graphs of circles.
for those of you that have looked into this so far, is there a type of problem that's giving you difficulty? Could you go over the absolute value inequalities? Yes, I can do that. I knew that would give someone trouble. Okay. I'll do an absolute value inequality question. Are there anything else? Is there anything else? Uh, also, uh, yep. how to work a radical equal inequality? Yeah, like um, to have like x squared and um, and continuous with plus or minus numbers how to sim simplify and factor it, I guess. Like, how to determine the value of the variable inside the radical. Oh, okay. Um, can you find an example of that? Because what I'm thinking of is something like this. Square root of x squared minus 16. Like yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I can do that problem later. Uh, as well. That's question 74. Okay, so uh, 74. Maps of values. Maps of values is from 1.8. It's fine. So I'll do 86, perhaps. 86. So to catch everyone up, I'm going to do an absolute value problem. This will be question 86 from section 1.8. And then I'll move on to 1.9, which is dealing with radicals and, and things like this underneath them. And it'll be plotting. 1.9 is all about plotting, looking at graphs. So, more on that If you have other questions that pop up that you want to go through, maybe you could even get on one side now and look at real wicked problems with I can ask this list. Make this all the cards. Problem 86 says solve the absolute value of inequality, express the answer using interval notation and graph the solution set. 86 is the fraction of x plus 1 over 2 in absolute values greater than or equal to 4. This is what you were asking about, this sort of thing? Yeah. So, yes. we're, we're just trying to find what value of x work. Uh, yeah, that would do. right? So, we want a distance bigger than 4. What we're looking for. And what is the number that we're trying to make sure is farther away from farther away from origin than four? What is that number? How do we describe it? Everything is wrong. This number, whatever it is, needs to be farther away from zero than four. This needs to be farther away. So if I just put a number line down, here's four, then zero, here's four, that's positive four away, and here's negative four, that's still four, four units away. So our question is, for what value of x does this number, x plus one over two, land out here or out here? Two possibilities here, we're going to solve both. Either the number we plug in either x makes x plus 1 over 2 greater than 4, no absolute value. If this on its own, we plug in a number and on its own, without the absolute value, 
it's out here. We're good. Because you take the output value of it and nothing changes. It's still out there because that's a positive number. Absolute value doesn't change that positive, it keeps the same. So either our input makes that true, or what's the other possibility? Yeah. Yeah. Either we plug in a number and we land out here before taking the opposite value, or we land out here to the left of this negative four before taking the opposite value. The absolute value then removes the sign and it throws our answer over there where we want, where we want to be. Like the first case. So we've got two problems now. This is always the case with absolute values. You always, with a, a problem that has one absolute value, you always get two problems to solve. Which is great. More math, right? Well, <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's some difficulties in solving these, but it, if you can solve these, you can solve an absolute value equation. You need to reason through how to go from here to there. And it really just boils down to either the positive of the inside function satisfies the inequality, or the negative of the inside function satisfies the reverse inequality. So the positive doesn't change a thing. The negative satisfies the reverse. Those are the two things. Do you need me to solve this now? Would you like me to continue, to continue solving or is, is that enough? We lost her. What do you guys think? So you want me to do it or not? Uh, sorry, my, my mute was on. Um, oh, so okay. when you take down the absolute value, um, the, the sign changes and it becomes a negative four? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, that from now on. Uh, greater than seven or less than negative seven. So what this is telling us is if we plug in any number bigger than seven, this works. Right? Seven plus one is eight divided by two is four. That gives us the equality. Two. If we pick a number bigger than that, we're good. Negative seven. Clearly, you said. Not that. Oh, whoa. Uh, two times negative four. Yep, negative eight. Subtract one more. Negative nine. We plug in any number less than negative nine, we get negative four in here or less. And then we now just value it, bring it over. Uh, I'm not above reproach, so if I make a mistake, stomp your feet, pull out your hair, scream at me. Okay. What say. happens to in, um, the the equal sign on the bottom? Oh yeah, I didn't put it in yet. Usually I go back oh. and check the endpoints. And okay. it's not. Leave it in there. That's fine. Do you have to make a third, um, the third one that it equals to, or no? Uh, not if you're doing these maps correct, right? This will handle every case. You don't okay. have to check. Yeah. Um, the more cautious approach is to leave the equal signs on, because that's that's more restrictive. Um, 
if you remove them, it's less restrictive. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's it. To, to graph the answer, we would just, here's our negative seven, negative nine, solid point, shade over here. Here's our positive seven, solid point, shade over here. That's the graph. You can write it in interval notation or step it over if you want. Okay. One point nine. Number seven four. Okay, find the x and y intercepts of the graph of the equation. Okay, find x and y intercepts. And here's our y equals square root of x squared minus 16. Um, was this the kind of question you were asking about? I guess that's my first question. My second question is how do you find intercepts? Or what are intercepts? Yep. Here's the x axis, here's the y axis. So, wherever this graph crosses those, those are our intercepts. What does that mean about, let's say this is an y intercept? What does that mean about the coordinates here? What's the x coordinate for the y intercept? Always zero. Always zero. The y axis is the line created by the equation x equals zero. That's what it is. So the x-intercept, or sorry, y-intercept x coordinate is always zero. Let's say that this is the x-intercept. What is its pattern or its in, uh, uh, coordinates? Y is always zero, perfect. Just from the definition of these things, we know how to solve this. To find the y-intercept, what do you do? You plug in zero for x. That an issue for anyone? If not, we'll move right on. All good. All right. Four imaginary columns. That's great. Yes. There's no real y. Okay, so what does that mean? It means it doesn't actually cross this line. If you get some imaginary y intercept, that's exactly what it is. Truly, it, it's imaginary in the sense that it's there, but it's not actually on this plane. Um, in reality, this curve that we've got here bends out of this plane. I'll show you the graph in this right now. The graph of this is like this. It looks like, uh, it goes on forever like this. It looks like square roots on the left and right. But that's the it looks like this sort of thing. Uh, this is and negative four. And then it bends out in all the directions. Outside of this board, it's actually curving through space, like through three dimensional imaginary space, and it's crossing the y axis, or rather like a plane sort of thing. But anyway, so how do we find these x intercepts? The one that I kind of just said. Uh, 
we treat this as our rule. You know the why. So, the x intercepts. That y equals zero. And then we solve. So, what numbers can you plug in here to give us zero underneath? Yeah, in fact, we factored this earlier today. We could use the same rule. So what are those two numbers? Do you have to remember them? Yeah. 4 squared is 16. Minus 16 is 0. 0 is 0. Check. Negative 4 squared is 16. Minus 16 is 0. Square root of 0 is 0. So we have to get 2. So we know for a fact that it's minus 4 and positive 4. There's two intercepts, two, two x intercepts. Here they are, negative four, zero, four, zero. And there's no y intercepts, no real y intercepts. It all just comes from the definition. Yeah. If we have a degrading graph, like on a computer, that we could uh, represent i. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll actually need four. Four dimensions. I mentioned this plane. What's actually happening is there's this real plane, and then a little bit off, there's another imaginary plane. And so what's happening is the graph is bending to this other plane, and it's crossing here and coming back down into the real plane. Yeah, explore that. You a computer science guy? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you know about uh, Anaconda? The, the, the programming suite of Anaconda? Okay, there's a high block of math block with, yeah, they can handle things like this. Look into this, uh, Although the graphs are going to be more colorful because they use colors to illustrate that fourth dimension instead of fonts. So a point is mapped to a color depending on how imaginary it is or how imaginary it's not. A, a lot of fun can be had on that. Yeah. Yeah, how's everybody doing? This uh I don't see any closed eyes out here. That's good. It's early in the morning. We good online? All right. Um, do we want problems on just graphing a random equation? Do we need help with that? That's and before on nonlinear equations. Graphing nonlinear equations? Yeah. Lines, I hope we can all graph. Plot a point, use the slope. That's that's pretty easy. So yeah, how about a nonlinear? How about just a random equation? Uh, I can let you make it up. How to graph an equation. Yeah. 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 Make one up. Nonlinear. Okay, don't make it too easy. Make one up. Y equals two. How are you? Give me some. Something in gross looking. Do you need a name? Easy. Who's next? Plus what? 18. It's a little harder, but I, I can still add 18. Easy. What's next? Nine squared. 
19 and 18x squared. And I couldn't hear you, sir. Get it yet? Minus 4. Okay. You want to stop here or do you want to add anything else? You see, the process is the same no matter what. I'm going to do it the same way your computer does. It's the same process. So every year I do this, I tell my students, no graph is perfect. Literally no graph is perfect. There's always mistakes. Even the ones on your 1440p computer screen or TV screen or whatever, no matter how far you zoom in, there's error. And the reason is your computer, which graphs in pretty much the same way you can see here, does this. Takes your X. And it takes, in particular, the window size, your X, how far down, like negative 10, and positive 10, and how far up it goes, and it just divides it up. It says, I'm going to plug in this number, this number, this number, this number, this number, all the way down to this number, this number, this number, this number. And then it evaluates those numbers. So it takes a ton of numbers, it evaluates them, and it gets the output, and it just plots all those little numbers. And then what do you think it does? It draws straight lines between them. Sorry, that's all it does. Straight lines, not curved lines, straight lines. So if you could like freeze its computations and zoom in, you would see jagged edges like this. It makes it look smooth by picking more and more and more points. A computer that can run how many computations a second, what's the processor speed that we're up to nowadays? Five gigahertz, so giga is times 10 to 1. Kill is a thousand, mega is a million. Giga is a billion. Five billion computations a second on a single core processor. How many computations do we need to do this? Less than five billion. So you do this even a billion times, and that's a pretty fine resolution. So anyway, we're going to do that same process. There you go. It's not linear. We're just going to pick a bunch of points. Let's graph between. Yeah, cubes are pretty big. And multiply by 18 is kind of nasty. But, uh, let's pick small numbers. We'll choose a small graphing window. So negative two and two. If you want to make it a larger graph, you just yeah, pick one, pick larger numbers, smaller numbers. But this is how you do it. You graph an equation by picking some inputs. You compute what you get. I'll do the easy one. Zero cube, zero squared, zero plus zero, minus four, minus four. And you get the output. And what this gives you then, or this graph, is just a sequence of points 0, negative 4. So that's that point. And I just plotted it. I'll plot five more. 1 is 9 plus 18, 27, minus 4 is 23. 1, 23. Wow. I hope you get the idea. I'm not going to keep doing this. If you want a better graph, you pick more points and you compute more points. Especially if it's something that you don't know. That's how you have to do it. If I threw something like this at you, graph the natural log of x. Could you do it? Probably not. You don't even know what that is. But with your calculator, right? Mohammed, your calculator, I see, has natural log. So your calculator could compute things. You could make a table, and you could graph it. Okay, you just make a table of points, you plot the points, and that's how you graph it. An unknown equation. Uh, there are common ones. X cubed, X squared, there are common ones. I know for a fact this one looks like this. 
generally speaking. I don't know where it is. I don't know how steep it is. Uh, it might even have like a little hump in the middle, like this. But it looks, for the most part, like this. But yeah, sure, sure. This thing comes down. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the equations for both picks are much nicer than that one. So they'll work out much nicer. Generally, x squared has a graph like this, x cubed has a graph like this, x to the fourth has a graph like this, x to the fifth has a graph like this, x to the sixth. If it's odd, it looks like this. Maybe some wiggles here in the middle. But if this power is odd, it looks like this. If this power is even, it looks like this. For polynomials. Uh, other things like exponentials, they look like this. Uh, logarithms generally look like this. Okay. So you're not a lumberjack then. No. They love natural laws. Signs and other trig functions are ways that look like this. Tangent looks weird. It looks like a bunch of x cubes. We'll get to these things, I think, eventually. These things later on. In general, I, I know that's a general answer to your question. How do you graph nonlinear equations? You plot points. You connect them. Uh, you can also use additional information like this in how to connect them. And just understand that you're, whenever you're asked to graph something, you're asked to graph an approximation, not the exact thing. Okay, let's move on. 9.05, great day. We get way more problems done online, I think. <laughs> I just, here we go. Uh, let's go to 110. Uh, 1.9 is, is again, just plotting things for the most part. So is 110, plotting more things. So I guess we have covered everything for the most part. Do you want me to just pick some hard problems and work through them? Is that okay? Hard is relative here. Um, okay, let's, I don't know, number, number 94. From one, nine. There's a section here about circles and finding their equations. Uh, 94 is one of the last ones in that problem section. It says, find the equation of circle that satisfies the given conditions. It goes through, for number 94, these two points, negative one, three, and q, seven, Negative dots. And these are endpoints of the diameter. He wants us to give the equation to a circle which has these two points that are endpoints of one of its diameters. Just to help, you might consider graphing these two points. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is one point, that's Q. Uh, negative one, three, that's P. And then this is the diameter of that circle. So the circle we know looks something like this. And that's the diameter. 
First step, we go. Okay, that's fine. Does anyone remember what a circle equation looks like? The form of it? The parabola has this form, you know, it's like ax squared plus bx plus c, y equals, like that. Do you remember the form of a circle? That's okay. Is it 2 pi r? That is the circumference of a circle. Oh. You have to be the length of this dotted line. You have to cut it, stretch it out, and measure it. That's the line. Uh, is it x minus h squared plus y minus k squared? Well, you're right. Radius squared. Got to be right. Okay. If we were to simplify this just a little bit, if you equation like this, no number there. This is a circle. It's the back of the circle. Notice how it's different from a gravel. There's no linear term. And the y is squared. Okay, you get a square x, you get a square y, and a constant. That's a circle. Uh, I think that was Mario, perhaps, that said that. Maybe that was who it was. She gave it in this form, though. We've got x minus h squared. This is okay. We still got an x squared. She says y minus k squared. Same thing. This is okay. What this does, though, is it shifts the circle. This circle has a center, and it stays right there. I'm not right there, I don't know if that's perfect. Its coordinates are h, k. That form that she gave us is the equation for a circle with radius r, star, With center at the point h comma k. So start. We need to find that center. How do we find that point? Say it louder. We find the diameter. If we can find this length, right? Find that thing. How do you find it? Distance formula. Yeah. You, Euclidean distance formula, right? We'll use. Yeah, we'll, we'll use this formula to find the length of that die of the diameter. So we're gonna take the square root of this. We're gonna take the difference of these x dots. Seven minus a negative one is eight. The difference of the x's. 7 minus negative 1. And we're going to square it. Then we're going to look at this distance between the y's. Negative 5 minus 3 is negative 8. But then we're going to square it. So it doesn't matter if I were positive or negative. And that tells us the distance between this point and this point. The reason it does so is because we've got this diameter. We know it's x and y coordinates here and there. And all we're doing is we're using the Pythagorean theorem. x1 minus x2 to find that distance. y2 minus y1 to find this distance. We're squaring them and adding them. To give us the hypotenuse. Okay. 
which is the diameter of the circle. It's just the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so we get the square root of 64 plus 64, the square root of 128, which is 8 root 2. 64 plus 64 minus 7, 3, 3, 2. So that's the diameter. Uh, for the formula of the circle, we need to know the radius, right? So we'll just divide it by 2. And then square it. Right? So for our formula, take the diameter over 2, so that's 4 squared to 2, and then we're going to square it, which is 16 times 2, so 32. How do we find the center point now? We know it's we know it's uh, four root two from here to there. That's the length, but it's at an angle. So what does that exactly mean? Let's look at this picture. Midpoints like right here. If you know this, and you know this, how are you going to find the coordinate of that middle point? Geometrically, yeah. Um, but computationally, it boils down to the middle, the center of the diameter is at the middle of these x coordinates and at the middle of these y coordinates. How do you find the exact middle of two, two numbers? You average them. You add them and divide by two. That's it. So here we go. 7 plus negative 1 is 6. Divide by 2 is 3. x minus 3 squared. Negative 5 and 3 added together is negative 2. Divided by 2 is negative 1. There it is. Midpoint formula finds you the center of the circle in this case. Distance formula tells you the radius. Nine seventeen. Three minutes. Any last minute questions? We didn't really get to 11, but it's uh, finding the slope of a line through two points, finding the uh, y-intercept of a point of a line. Um, it's, it's lines, that's the whole section is on lines, which are far simpler than what we've been doing. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I would put some time into memorizing some formulas that come up, right? Um, technically speaking, the tests and quizzes are supposed to be closed book, closed notes. No, sure, 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 whatever. But so my level of, or my expectation is if you come to a problem on a quiz or a test and you're like, oh, I wish I had that memorized. Well, my expectation is that you would. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, level of total understanding. You don't need to understand what's going on here necessarily for this class. You just need to be able to do it in, in some sense. Uh, so you need to know when to apply it, not necessarily know how to apply it in any generic situation outside of this classroom. There's a different level of understanding of that. You know what I mean? Like 10 years from now, if you really understand this now, 10 years from now, you're probably gonna still be able to do it at your job perhaps somewhere. I'm not really looking for that. I hope as, as future math majors, you all would. Uh, yeah. Or future computer science majors, whatever. It's pretty close. You can't see me smiling. I'm joking when I say that. You, you can do whatever you like with your life. You know, other majors are good too, right? So, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, we've got 30 seconds left. If there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and call it here. So thank you for everyone that came online. I hope this is gonna be clear enough for you. Uh, for everyone here, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. We'll exit from the back first and uh, I'll see you office hours tomorrow if you need them. Tomorrow morning at eight, that's on Zoom. Uh, and then again, Friday homework is due. Uh, on this material, 1819110. There's a quiz Monday on 1819110. And Monday office hours and class here Wednesday next week. Okay. All right. Don't be strangers. I'll see you all later. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.